sorry for the uh, confusion with the login. <laughs> I, uh, I'm very grateful to one nice student who kind of messaged me earlier saying, I think it's just me, I'm disorganized, but I can't find this. And then when I logged in and I saw that I was the only participant, I thought, yeah, bleh. and um, yeah. Um, sometime very late last night, a bit before the sun came up, I was absolutely sure that I uh, posted that in a message in uh, Moodle. But I guess what I did was I hurriedly wrote that, then jumped out of Introduction to Business, jumped into another course, and um, hadn't made sure that it was sent and then it wasn't saved. So sorry about that. Um, I'll teach you one excellent word from Hebrew, and uh, it's a word called baragan, which actually it, it, it has a nice Indonesian kind of hibik to it. Um, it's inter interesting, though, from an Indonesian perspective to mention Israel. But baragan is this great Hebrew word for kind of confusion or chaos. Um, and almost every meeting or event I ever attended in Israel when I was there for a year, the organizers always opened up by saying, very sorry for the baragan in the beginning. So that's, um, should, I should get that tattooed on me somewhere. Okay, uh, lots to do today. Um, first of all, uh, I hope you've all at least seen that the groups are now formed and that uh, you also have a very detailed two page uh, explanation of the project. Okay, and uh, I think it's a, it's a fairly straightforward kind of project. I don't think there can be too much confusion about um, what I'd like you guys to do. Um, so it's very long. Some of you are gonna need a cup of coffee just to actually get your mind around that to sit and read it, okay? Uh, but I think it, if, if there's anything that's not clear, tell me and I'm happy to do uh, to send follow-up explanations, but I think it's, I think it's quite straightforward. Um, of course, it uh, very deliberately builds on our early exercise that we did, what makes a good coffee shop. Now, what I've done here is all of those very nice um, ideas you had, we had the breakout groups and some of you went to considerable effort actually in typing up and, and um, sending me summaries in through the chat. All of that I captured and I have here. I'm just, uh, I've still got it organized by uh, Shera and with names and whatnot, which is good for you guys in terms of in, you know, the engagement mark. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do is that I, uh, I intend to actually organize this more by point, okay? So everyone will have this kind of common shared knowledge about your collective wisdom about what makes for a good coffee shop. But then on the basis of that, you then go and actually look at the ecology or the, the landscape or the market for coffee shops um, here in Tokyo and Bigger than Tokyo. I haven't actually specified that this has to be a coffee shop in Tokyo. Uh, that there, there is some scope to do something like really kind of crazy out there or whatever. Um, I don't know if you want to have a coffee shop floating in balloons or something and drifting around Tokyo. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, that's that's not a hint. Uh, I, I just don't want to constrain your thinking at all. But uh, there's certainly the possibility you might say this is such a crowded market we have to do something completely different. Okay. Uh, so anyway, it's a, uh, it's a several stage process. Uh, the first process, uh, first stage of course, is to really explore the landscape of coffee. And of course, the historical context, you know, Japan had this very distinctive culture of kisaten, which is, you know, inspired, of course, by um, ideas of French cafes and whatnot, um, but a very distinctive um, culture of kisaten with regional variations. For example, when I first came to Japan many, many years ago, first lived in Japan, uh, actually I was in Nagoya, and Nagoya's kisaten culture is very distinctive with its uh, morning setto. And uh, you see that a little bit in Tokyo and whatnot as well, but with the coffee and uh, normally it's buatsi pan and uh, toast, toast and um, sometimes a couple of other things and uh, quite a reasonable price. Um, I used to find that the, co the, uh, the coffee was often left simmered too long on the pot, so it used to be a bit uh, bitter. Um, but the, uh, the whole concept of the, of the, the morning set was, was very distinctive. So we've got the kisaten 
culture and that there's a bit of a traditional kind of artisanal element there too with uh, the master and master no and and of course the uh, the culture of the hand pour coffee which uh, has become very much a on-trend thing in a range of other countries you know i i first lived in japan in the early 1990s and was very impressed with the hand pour culture and of course when I went back to Australia to be a graduate student and then an academic working in Australian universities I had my uh, Kalita um, filter these days I use a Hardy or V60 a um, bit different shape and heaps of coffee filter papers and I would always do my hand pour and I've been doing that now for 30 30 years and uh, people always used to come to me fascinated they'd see me doing the hand pour and they'd say oh next time you come back from Japan can you bring me one of those really cool Japanese hand pour kind of holders now you go into any supermarket or department store uh, in a lot of countries and you'll see them for sale so it's going to spread um, through the world at large at the same time of course uh, over the last couple of decades we've seen Starbucks arrive and more recently boutique coffee brands Blue Bottle and some others and we also see distinctive japanese coffee entrepreneurs tallies and whatnot each of them has their own approach um, and then there's a whole bunch of other interesting um, brands that have been around for quite a while renoir and many others so if you map these try and identify the different customer bases they serve um, when i used to come to japan before i live, lived here but came on work trips uh, for me when i was in a hurry um, before I went off to meetings in the morning, Doltoro was always a kind of a, um, a quick place to go. Uh, yeah, the coffee somewhat, uh, but also the broader pack, uh, no, offering of what they had there was the uh, their various A san or B san or toka, um, especially that nice one with the uh, no, like Ebi, uh, no, Ebi san or whatever that's called. And uh, so they they do some really distinctive things. And uh, within the broader coffee space, you've got other other interesting things like San Marco with the uh, no, Choco Kuro, for example. So that's that's more about the food menu than about the coffee. Uh, but they're all, in a sense, competing. And one concept I want you to think about, I'll tell you straight away, is that there's quite a discussion about the role of coffee shops as third places. Daisan no basho. You know, they're not... They're not home and they're not school or work. They're third places. And... Uh, I know my daughter when she should have been going uh, to her high school, um, or more importantly, on the way back from high school, she should have been coming straight home, um, seemed to spend an enormous amount of time in Starbucks instead, um, lingering um, with a couple of her uh, friends. And she went to, uh, maybe some of you went to it, some of you might know, Edogawa Joshi. Um, and, she lived right in central Tokyo, but she went out. <laughs> um, and while the, it's ostensibly a strict school and they weren't supposed to go to cafes and things like that in their school uniform. So they're always afraid of getting seen by one of their teachers. So they used to go out of the way Starbucks and hang out just for hours um, and be a bit bad, which was perfect training for her then to become a sole student, right? Okay. Anyway, so think about the various functions or the very values, various values that coffee shops add. Uh, a couple of things straight away. Some you, you will discover a lot of this when you do your own research. Um, one anecdote, I'm not sure if it's true, but many people in the hospitality business in Japan tell this story that supposedly Starbucks is the single largest purchaser of fresh milk in the hospitality business in Japan. I don't know if it's true, if it's an urban legend, uh, never, never been able to affirm with executives. Uh, but if you think about it, it does make sense. They, they sell a lot of very milky drinks. So we tend to think of, you know, Starbucks is, is all about the coffee and uh, they certainly make a point of selling lots of coffee and they have their own roastery and, and various things. Um, but if they're selling a lot of milk at supply, it, it suggests that it's not just about the coffee or maybe even rather less about coffee and rather, rather more about other things. Um, maybe it is more of that third place kind of phenomena. So think beyond the coffee, think about the value proposition that these spaces provide. And also as a consequence, think about, um, you know, the economics of, coffee shops is is the uh, is it just 
is it just enough to have the coffee superb? You know, there are, especially in Japan, for anything, there are maniac, you know, people who will line up for two hours for some ramen shop, um, be treated kind of rudely, eat and immediately have to get out again and then and still say it was the best experience of their life, <laughs> lives, okay. Um, so you do have these maniac, really hardcore lovers of products. Um, and so it may be it may be possible to to me the you know um, ultra coffee only kind of place where you have no seats um, or you put spikes on the seats so people can't sit on them or whatever you know, they have to stand and suffer um, in order to drink your magnificent coffee so maybe that will work maybe it won't uh, you really have to do uh, a lot of looking at the landscape of the existing um, coffee scene in Tokyo and beyond I don't want to limit to to Tokyo. And um, then your own creativity. What, what can you come up with as a group with some interesting ideas? Um, now, of course, one other interesting thing is in we're, we're doing this virtually in the, in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. And so that actually introduces another variable, another, another challenging issue in terms of the economics of coffee shops. If, if we don't get a vaccination, if social distancing continues to be an issue, um, then the kind of Starbucks model of squashing them in a little bit closer in recent years, making, making it a bit more luxurious in some ways, but also jamming them a bit closer together, uh, looks problematic as a kind of business model. And so the decor, the interior design and whatnot is not just about the emotional resonance or the emotional response to the space and how you connect with the customers and the values you communicate through the, through the spatiality, uh, but it also might have these other issues of the pandemic. Of course, if on the other hand, you're just like, Mah, you don't want to deal with that, then uh, maybe you, you, I, I'm okay too if you just collectively declare that you have faith in modern science and then in a year's time, we will have a vaccination for COVID-19. And as a consequence, we don't need to worry about social distancing and therefore you're going to assume that it goes away. That's fine too. You know, um, I'm not actually investing my money in this directly, so I'm happy... Uh, for you to do that as a planning premise and to do this as a thought experiment, okay? Um, we can't constantly live in the, uh, the uncertainties of what this thing means, uh, this, this pandemic means for us, okay? Uh, so just a couple of things about the um, uh, group project, of course. Your product, what you, you will give to me is a PDF. And it's a presentation slide stack. So you make it in Keynote, make it in PowerPoint, save it as a PDF, okay? The assumption would be that you would be presenting this to this um, uh, potential investor, this benefactor, this rich businesswoman you happen to know who has told you that she will invest in your business if you can convince her that it makes a lot of sense. Um, and she wants a convincing presentation. Uh, this is often actually how the world works. Very often uh, companies or you know, branding consultancies, for example, uh, or startups get an opportunity to pitch, to present their idea uh, to potential investors or to, to uh, a potential client, maybe in the case of one, in case of branding consultancies who want to buy the services. Um, and so the typical product is in fact a slide stack and the very important point here is that uh, not everyone on the client side will see it as an actual presentation. So in fact, what often happens in large organizations and friends of mine running consultancies and whatnot are always saying this, it's a design dilemma in terms of making the slides that you typically present to, for example, the marketing manager or the new business development manager and their team, then they take that slide set and then they, if they like it, they show it to more senior executives. So they present it to um, maybe all the way to the CEO. Um, for him, I'm doing a lot of stuff for McDonald's and um, a number of times has you know, dined with the, the CEO of McDonald's and whatnot, but has never given a presentation. The actual stand and deliver presentation, slide two, three, four, five, has never actually done that to the CEO, um, has dined with the CEO, has handed over the slide set, or very often the CEO has already looked through the slide set that um, her staff has seen presented to them. Uh, 
So it becomes a physical artifact or a digital artifact um, uh, on the basis of which senior executives will, will make decisions. So which means that on the one hand, it has to be kind of, you know, punchy, has visual impact as a presentation, uh, but it also has to include some core points and statistics that would give you authority, that uh, would give the reader rather than the viewer of a presentation who has the benefit of listening to you as well, the confidence that actually there's a lot of serious analysis in this, okay? So there are various visual techniques you can do. Um, I've said 40 to 50 slides, that might scare you, but remember there is a, uh, you're a team of seven and we're very fortunate with the numbers in the class. Um, fortunate and unfortunate, um, some people dropped out. I think I scared people off. So we started at 200 and we're down to 182. Um, the advantage of 182 is, well, it's perfect. Um, a to Z, 26 letters, 26 groups, seven perfectly in each group. It's, it's normally I have a dilemma of everyone gets seven members, but someone gets eight or one group only gets six or something like that. So each of your groups are the magnificent seven. Okay. Um, generally in group work, it's considered that seven is a pretty good number. Um, it's enough to divide up the work so that it's not too much of a burden for each person, assuming each person makes a fair contribution. And I'll say about something about that in a moment. But at the same time, seven is not too many that you have the problem of what we call free riding. You know, if the groups are too big, people think, mm, so you are going to get caught out if you don't make a fair contribution. Okay. And I'll say now, because I'm also going to say something about assessment in a moment. Um, I've been looking at uh, rates of access to the online material. Uh, through Moodle, I can see when each of you have accessed and what you've accessed and whatnot. And I'm also looking at view rates of the videos on the YouTube channel. And I can see that there are there is a very significant asymmetry of engagement or connection with this course. Uh, there are a bunch of people who seem to just think if you just show up, uh, that's enough. Uh, no. No, it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> particularly, um, one of the things that has just amazed me is that I'm getting many, many more people um, attending the live sessions than um, accessing the set of slides on Moodle. I cannot comprehend why anybody wouldn't get the slides and get the slides in advance. I mean, I make a point of staying up normally extremely late to get these things done so that they are ready for people to um, ideally look through in advance. So, and then it's much easier to follow what I'm saying if you've got them. And similarly, my online videos are structured completely in order. The playlist follows completely the order of the topics in the slides. And, um, Last week, for example, I've noticed that there's only been 125 views of those slide sets. So get the slides, okay? Um, even if you re and the videos uh, will go up the uh, last class. The even if you re rewatch the video with the slides, they're still for review purposes. The slides are extremely useful, and the best way to take notes is to have the slides and annotate them, add to the slides as you as you go. I I, I think that's a no-brainer. Um, I say more generally, you know, I, 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 I don't want to sound callous, but just remember, remember how much Wasada costs, remember how much study abroad costs. So by comparison to pop off to big camera or Yodabashi or something and spend Niman in on a, um, on an Epson or a Canon printer and some cartridges, um, or to get an iPad or some other tablet and uh, to be able to have the handouts on hand, um, either in digital form on a tablet or in a printout um, is a no brainer. It just, it just makes sense. Just similarly um, to get a, get a, a good internet connection. You know, if, if that means going to 
um, UQ Mobile, WiMAX, <laughs> whatever, um, Rakuten actually are kind of almost giving away unlimited data sims at the moment to get people to sign up to the new network. Um, so, you know, get, get that extra kind of backup. Oh, you, you just, in, in any game, you've got to have, you got to have the right tools and, um, you know, um, I'll move my camera and show you what I mean. If you look over there, uh, that, uh, my desk, I'll show you over there. I'm going to make you all sick. Okay. Oops. No, let's look over there. See over there. Right. Um, what's all that stuff on my desk? Um, that's about Sanju Mun's worth of camera, tripod, um, a whole range of, uh, devices and things and whatnot to make it a lot easier to actually make uh, videos uh, for the class backup computer. Oh God, yeah, no, I'm, I'm the horrors of what I'm, I'm I'm spending at my own self expense to kind of get through this. Um, just get yourself the tools. Um, one final anecdote on this um, tools, and I will come back to this with discussion of precision when I talk about operations. Um, there are lots of false economies. People often try to do things on the cheap. Uh, two things you should never be tight about, never be catchy to say about. One of them doesn't matter now because you can't travel. Suitcases. Do not buy a cheap, cheap suitcase. Um, you know, the last thing you need when you're trying to haul your stuff through the Paris subway is for the handle or the wheel to break off your suitcase. Um, I, I choke at the price, but I, uh, I always use um, limo or suitcases. Um, the other thing is uh, never economize on tools, never buy a cheap hammer um, and even worse, never buy cheap nails or screws or screwdrivers. Um, your fingers are not worth it. Okay. So you do not buy equipment um, that is used to make something from a hundred yen store. Okay. By all means buy cheap note paper or something like that, stick it or whatever, but even then they fall off and they're really, really um, so invest in the basic equipment you need to do this. Okay. So, um, get those lecture notes, print them out, engage with them. Um, and a final thing in terms of engaging with a text. Okay. I don't give students a huge amount of reading material. I don't actually hear it's all digital. I'm giving you almost none. Right. Okay. Um, I don't, bury students in reading material. I, I prefer students to get into the habit of reading really carefully and deeply. And so whenever you get a task, um, read it really carefully and say, what am I really being asked to do? One of the most important things in business, in work in general, is do what you're being asked to do not what you think you're being asked to do. Or even worse, um, the quickest way to annoy a professor, annoy a boss, is when you've been given written instructions on how to do something, and you go up to them, it's like, ah, oh, can you just tell us what we've got to do again? Your answer is no, read the instructions, <laughs> okay? Um, and if you don't get it, at least look like you've tried. Uh, students who, want, even if they, they have bought the printer or whatever, they, they'll come up and they'll say, well, I don't know what we've got to do. I can't really understand this. And I look at it and it's like a perfect bit of paper. Super fresh. Okay. If someone, come, um, if someone comes to me and they've gone line by line, yeah, it's like you can say learn to do. I'm always very impressed when I'm watching and uh, supervising Ipan Yushi. You know, I, I normally know the students who are going to get in just by the way that they mark up the, the exam, you know, the way they engage with the text. So look at it. One of, one of the really basic things I find students fail to do, and those of you in designing corporate communications, I've been shaking my head about this with um, the first exercise. The title of the exercise actually means something. You know, this one, Japanese coffee shop market analysis and business proposal. You know, I don't just randomly assign titles, you know, it's not like I'm going to call my goldfish William, you know, um, you know it might be meaningful, actually. Uh, William the goldfish, it might, it might be very meaningful. Um, but actually, I probably would think a lot about naming even the goldfish. But anyway, uh, when I give the title to a task, it is really, really meaningful. I have given it thought, okay? Uh, 
And so generally when people write instructions to you, there is the problem of the fallacy of assumed knowledge, you know, that people know what they want to say and other pe people on the other side might read it differently. So asking points of clarification is important. It is iterative. And very often I will find myself saying, oh, it was clear to me, but okay, I can see you can read that in two ways. But if you haven't deeply engaged, first of all, with it, you're not going to get a very good response. So I would suggest very early on, um, over the next day or two, use that forum I've set up there um, for each of the groups to interact, to make sure that you really have a good shared understanding of what's being asked in the task. Um, in my intermediate course, uh, designing corporate communications. I uh, mentioned yesterday, David Ogilvy, very famous pioneer of branding, advertising in the United States, Ogilvy and Mathan, very famous firm. Uh, one thing he always did was he always wrote a summary of his meeting with the client which was always in terms of, I understand you want me to do this, 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 and this in this time frame. He would send it to them and he would ask them to reply in writing, confirming exactly that understanding before he would do any work on the project. Um, he just wanted to cement, to assure mutual understanding. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, now, in terms of looking at instructions and how this carries over, I see a question here. Someone asked me, are we supposed to create one PowerPoint as a group or make our own individually? No, absolutely one as a group, okay. Um, the, the uh, no, <laughs> of course. Um, remember, this is, this is a business proposal. Um, so it's a team of people who want to create one business, okay and you are making your pitch. I, I almost gave her a name, actually, this like really rich awesome uh, um, who's got lots of money. And I'm Madam, like, uh, Madam, Madam Nandaro. I was thinking like Kinkle Summer or someone. I don't know. So if you want, you can, you can, amongst your group, you can make, you can give this, this um, powerful Obachan uh, business executive a name. And she's super, super, super tough, super smart, um, and also super kind to people who she likes and uh, wants to give people a chance. So if you come with a good, sincere proposal, she'll give you the money and you can get on with your business, okay? And actually, this happens quite a lot in life. I actually have a friend of mine um, who's met by chance this, exactly, tough old Obachan, um, who is astonishingly rich, and very keen to fund him in business if he can come up with an idea. Problem is he hasn't got any ideas at the moment. <laughs> so he's driving me mad trying to come up with ideas saying, I can, I can get the money if I can just get the idea, but I've got no ideas. So um, maybe some of you can help out on that. Okay. Um, okay. A uh, bunch of other questions. Um, I guess, yeah, pe people jump right to the end details. I mean, this is a month away, but you know, what about submitting the PDF? Do we all need to submit it or just choose one person? No, just one person can submit it. That's fine. Okay. Um, there will be a submission mechanism. So no, I'd, the last thing I want is seven versions of the same, um, probably very large PDF file. Okay. Other question, right. Um, okay. Uh, Amy asked an excellent question. Uh, about access, accessing the videos, not through Moodle, but through the YouTube account. Don't worry about that. Um, I'm assuming that's exactly uh, what happens. I'm, I'm in no way using metrics of video viewing. Um, the whole point of having a channel and uh, of having a playlist and asking people to subscribe, in fact, I'm surprised how few people have, is precisely you can find the videos. You don't have to go through Moodle. So no, certainly, certainly not. No, um, I'm, I'm only speaking just at um, how many people haven't actually logged into Moodle, um, Moodle uh, at all or uh, accessed, for example, the uh, slides. So that's what I was speaking to. So don't worry. No, um, absolutely no need to go to Moodle to click through to YouTube. That's, 
that's silly and counterproductive. And one of the major reasons why I, uh, I put it on the YouTube channel was because you can get a um, HD definition, for example, view playback 1080. So if you want to watch it on your TV screen or something, God forbid, I'm, actually I'm very conscious that when I'm filming it and it's really horrible I think you're going to see haggard old, um, tired and aging me on your huge TV or something. Uh, but no, that's the way I prefer people to kind of access it. Okay, um, I'll read a couple of these other comments from here so I can give feedback to people straight away. Um, right. Okay, yes, um, and this question about being able to access the forum of the groups. Um, this is, um, if someone else can answer this, I'd be very grateful. <laughs> um, there is this quirk in the system where be I can go into a student view, but because I don't have a student ID, when I toggle into student view, it tells me you don't have permission to see the, uh, the group interfaces, okay? Even though I created the groups in the first place, it's really bizarre. So yes, you, the, through the forum, the problem is you can message it, but it's just like throwing it out there blind and you just hope that you get seven or six replies. Um, and so you can't actually see the names of the people. Now, a, Oh, thank you. Thank you, Maya. She just said subscribe to my website. Actually, I, I do feel like a YouTuber. It's like, just click and subscribe. Okay. Um, if I get, when we're not at 100, there are 182 students in the class. If I actually, we're only at about 70 subscriptions. If I get to 100, I can actually create the Pocket Chan YouTube URL, which is easier for people to find. So that that's the main reason why I want to get to 100. Um, just that makes it a heck of a lot easier to share the site. And, uh, the uh, playlist and whatnot with people. Um, yeah, the question of the forum and being able to see members. Um, nice student told me with the designing corporate communications that uh, because uh, they've they've had the forum now for a while, although a few people only accessed it yes yesterday, which is annoying. But anyway, um, apparently, if you go into the participant. She, she said it to me, um, but I had too little sleep. So I think I got it straight. If you go into the participants option and you can see groups and then you can see the number in your group and then you click on the number um, and then that actually lists the individual members. And I think it's buried. I think if you go into participants and you go right down the bottom of the participants page, I think it's buried down there. Um, does anyone done that has anyone discovered that it's quite annoying it should be right at the top so obvious um, I actually spent a bit of time googling last night to try and find an answer on this and it's one of the things I, I couldn't actually find um, thank god that um, the vast majority of unit ah okay yes just found the group list um, Ah, yes, 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 okay. The list of members on the message box under the group. Oh, it's on the message box, okay, not the participants. Okay, um, right. Uh, Rota, Yutung, thank you very much. These are just the kind of shares that, uh, yes, next to your ID number, wonderful. Thank you. Um, this is one of the frustrating things with uh, Moodle rolling out at just the same time that we have a global pandemic, okay. That we're actually learning the uh, the basic functionality of our platform while also trying to use it at a, at a, at a level that no one's ever done it before. Anyway, what I was saying, one of the, um, the great advantages with um, particularly American, Australian universities, British universities, is that they tend to have a culture of openness and lots of people are using Moodle. And as a consequence, uh, if you Google, you can often find in English um, much, much better application uh, explanations of how to use certain functions in Moodle from various places. So last night I was at Swarthmore College, University of New South Wales, University of Glasgow, um, various websites um, that were talking about Moodle functionality. Oh, and uh, a final thing on that. Some people have, have asked about Moodle and they said, you know, what's it in the letter to yourselves they, about why you're not getting a fee reduction? The, president said, you know, we bought some expensive software and mentioned Moodle and whatnot. Um, and then some people replied saying, but isn't Moodle open source? Uh, yes, it is. So the basic elements of Moodle are actually free. Uh, 
They were developed by a guy in Perth in Western Australia as part of his PhD. And uh, many, many years ago, he was exploring about the possibilities of online delivery. And uh, as a PhD project, he started developing it and became so successful that he never finished his PhD. And still Moodle International is an office of about 20 people run out of Perth, <laughs> almost like out of a shed. Um, but are they, uh, they haven't sought to make much money. Um, and so it's out in the public domain. So you're probably wondering, but hasn't Wasser to spend lots of money? The thing is, though, although it's open source, it has to be set up and interfaced with each university system. So, for example, the ability to just import um, all automatically all the student information system. So the course enrollments that come straight into Moodle in Waseda, all of that is actually quite a complex system, what they call systems integration. That's where much of the money is actually in consulting these days. That's, that's uh, has to be done by some vendors. And uh, there've been some big companies like NEC networks and whatnot who've kind of jumped into that space to provide these services. So although the basic system is um, effectively free, public source, open source, you could actually <laughs> find a lot of the functionality yourself and, you know, if you're working for a Duke or something, you could actually probably do a free self rollout of Moodle if you wanted to. Um, but interfacing with the systems is uh, where institutions pay, and I suspect overpay because they often don't know how to buy IT systems. Um, I would hope Wasada had lots of lots of savvy um, on that. Um, similarly with Zoom, actually, the uh, the rolling out of Zoom is actually there are third party vendors and uh, a significant part of what happens in IT is actually um, reselling, you know, consulting and applications kind of way, um, a product that's done by another company or very often open source. Um, and a final thing on that is actually with programming, computer programming, some of you are into programming already know this, that actually no one writes pro um, programs a code from scratch that it's more assemblage it's in in many ways it's it's a combination of kind of it's it's almost like kind of lego in a way uh that you've got large blocks of code that are in the public domain and then you then the code you write is is about joining these bits of the puzzle together um for unique applications okay um now just reading a couple looking at other comments here uh good questions coming in um Okay, uh, very nice question from Ikto. Thank you, Ikto. Um, sent it privately. You shouldn't uh, shouldn't have hesitated. Uh, I appreciate your modesty, but it's a good question to ask. Everyone can benefit from. Um, to what extent do we recognize it as a coffee shop? As long as it sells coffee, is it a coffee shop? Okay, or does coffee need to be the main product or the product that makes the majority of the revenue? That is an excellent question. Okay, an excellent question. Uh, obviously, some businesses, they really lead with the coffee, like Blue Bottle Coffee. It's in the name. It's in the iconography and all the rest of it. And they sell food and whatnot. Um, Starbucks is strongly associated with coffee, but obviously makes a lot of its uh, money from other things. Uh, there are so many other places that sell coffee, you know, restaurants, cafes. Um, so I, th I think we... Uh, I, I have, I thought about this. I, I deliberately did call it a coffee shop rather than a cafe because cafe can be lots of things. You know, there's the owl cafe, there's the cat cafe, there's the rabbit cafe, blah, 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 blah. You know, there are, there's a vegan cafe near Wasada, a whole bunch of things. Um, so the cafe is a lot broader. So I've kept at the coffee shop. So yes, coffee, coffee has to be kind of central to the story. Um, in a sense, think of you, you and your friends doing this as all sharing a common love of coffee. But at the same time, you might come understandably to the conclusion that, well, everyone's doing good coffee. You know, you go to, you go to, um, um, Aoyama, Minami Aoyama, you know, back box of Amote Sando and there's, there's a uh, half a dozen, you know, fanta fantastic artisanal coffee shops. So we need coffee plus, okay? So yeah, it is a coffee shop, but it can be bigger than a coffee shop, okay? Um, and in the end, it actually, it doesn't, 
it doesn't matter that even the, the, the bulk of your revenue ended up coming from something other than the coffee. In fact, that's, that's wonderful. If, you, if you're going to escape the financial constraints of what coffee is as a, you know, as a product and a service, um, but still keep coffee central to the, the rationale, the imagery, imagery, the brand story, the vision, but coffee plus and what that plus is, is completely up to yourselves. Okay. Um, and I, I, I want to keep it tied to coffee and coffee culture, because I think there's a lot of identity and interesting things that are tied up with that. Um, there's, uh, there's an interesting film. Some of you may have seen coffee and cigarettes. Um, I'm not just a smoker. I'm an anti-smoker. Um, not least uh, because I have a couple of relatives who've had lung cancer and whatnot, and I've, I've seen what, what it does to you. Um, by the way, dying of lung cancer is really about drowning in your own body fluids. Uh, the worst thing I've ever seen in my life is intensive care ward for people who've got lung cancer. It's uh, Everyone should walk through it. But anyway, um, the coffee and cigarettes uh, movie brought together, uh, it's, it's a whole bunch of short stories put together, which is it's very interesting, particularly the one with Kate Blanchett. Um, it's just astonishing, so check it out. So anyway, uh, I do want it linked to coffee and coffee culture, and I do explicitly mention in the, uh, the handout that it would be very good to also do a bit of a survey in terms of representations of coffee culture in Japanese media. As we said earlier on, um, it's a little bit complicated in Japan too because you've got this very strange culture of canned coffee. It's, it's to, to an extreme degree in Japan. Uh, at one end, and you've got this hyper premium maniac coffee at the other end of the market, and then there's kind of everything um, in between. Okay, so um, yeah, Dun um, Duncan's level of coffee uh, would that be acceptable? Well. Yes, but they've also got donuts in the name, right? Well, they did. They still do, don't they? Dunkin' Donuts. Um, I guess they, uh, the donuts had to be dunked in something, right? It was dunk, dunked in the coffee. Um, so, yeah. So, coffee plus. Not coffee and cigarettes, but coffee coffee plus. Okay? And if, you, and, and if you come up with some creative plus that is the point of differentiation, that's fantastic. Okay? Um I don't know if coffee and tofu works, but uh, no, they both start with beans, but um, hmm. so something a bit creative. Okay. Um, okay, so Marcel, question, right? Uh, does not want a SWOT analysis, wondering if she also does not want a pestle analysis or a five forces um, analysis. Yeah. Um, um, I, I, You don't have to force it into it into a template, you know, um, I, I know it's good. You're familiar with these, these other ways of doing it. Uh, just keep, keep it straightforward. Uh, uh, I'm, 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 it's not a market research marketing course per se. It's broader than that. Um, generally I see in the consultancies that a few friends are involved in that own actually, uh, they, don't put it into those established analyses. In fact, far from it. What they want to do is they normally want to show that they have their own distinctive approach. Approach. So the last thing they want to do, and this is, you know, all of the major consulting firms as well, they would never use any of those standard kind of templates um, precisely because um, it looks a bit too business school and they want to, to distinguish themselves as having their own unique methodology. So I, I, I think it's fine to just simply divide it into an initial discussion of the landscape or the ecology of um, coffee, you know, coffee culture, identify the media, identify the major players, uh, ranging from the, the solo you know, master owner operated one in the Kisaten tradition to more artisan versions of that. And then the chain stores, oops, sorry, banging my mic. Um, and from there to get into your own unique concept. And in terms of getting to 40 or 50 slides, I imagine a, a, quite a number of those slides can be um, more about um, images. Uh, it's absolutely fine, you know, to like close-ups of kind of wood, um, textiles, you know, light, um, 
images of what you would like your uh, your packaging to be if you're going to have you know if it's paper takeout you know um if you uh determined to have plastic straws in an era when there's a war on plastic straws you know and a rationale for that uh or if you if your concept is something completely different that uh it's it's going to be served in you know fine crockery or whatever whatever your concept is the kind of things that when you look at it so that you get a feel about oh okay i can see what this space is going to be so um a whole bunch of images to do that i would suggest maybe adding meaningful text in to give some feeling to it okay so any any other questions while we're on the subject otherwise i'll, I'll move on to topic of today okay no okay good well i'll end the poll and i'll share it with you and i'm sorry basic design problem in the poll i forgot to give a uh, null response okay that if you hadn't used any of them um very interesting results and i'll share them with you straight away and i'll make a note on them myself um, cause I've discovered that actually I can't export the poll results because of the particular deal that, um, was that signed up to on zoom somehow, um, that functionality is disabled, which is really annoying. Okay. So Uber eats 58%. Wow. Okay. Booking.com. Right. Um, I'm a habitual user of booking.com, but I must admit one of the practical reasons for that is it just has a very nice export function to my iCal. And um, when I'm super busy uh, to have something just export to my calendar. And when I get off a plane, I'm dead tired. And I was like, where am I staying? I just look at my phone and I know, and the map is there and everything um, is good. Airbnb, 39%. Wow. Okay. That is very interesting. Okay. And also job sites, uh, 33%. Excellent. Um, now I'm going to admit I have never used Uber Eats. Um, I have never ordered, um, Denmai, uh, Denmai, Denmai, um, Denmai. Okay. Um, never ordered, uh, delivered food. In my life, um, my mother was a cooking teacher and uh, she kind of drummed into me that, you know, I don't know, from about, I was quite small. You're not a real man unless you can actually make your own food. <laughs> okay. uh, and uh, you'll, you'll never be never beholden uh, to someone in an, in an unhappy relationship if you uh, learn to, to actually cook yourself. So I, 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 I kind of have this idea that it's a personal indignity to have someone carry me food. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm always trying to make it myself, but I, uh, think it's a really good thing that we do have, um, platforms like Uber Eats now, um, in my country in Australia, there are a whole lot of people who suddenly lost their jobs because of the whole COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. Uh, but the way the lockdown worked was delivery was still allowed. And so uh, it was employment for a lot of people. Um, and so it's, uh, it's kept a lot of people out of, out of, out of poverty. And uh, I've used Uber quite a lot in the United States. And so it's very interesting to find how it actually can be really quite empowering for people um, who otherwise wouldn't have had similar kinds of op economic opportunities. There's been similar discussions in France and what too about that too. Um, although it's, you know, often sometimes highly, um, right, right, ethnotized in a sense, in terms of who owns the cars and who has the drivers. And so there's a lot of social issues, but anyway, very, uh, interesting. So now I'll turn over to our discussion on information and risk. Now there's uh, still a, a topic we haven't covered and that's creativity and adjustment. I'm going to put a video on demand for that. That's this, the, uh, the final third of last week, it's just being um, a mixture of busy and well, busy, uh, very busy, but also busy running around to a couple of hospitals and whatnot. Uh, be very open about the fact that I've had uh, uh, excruciating pain on one side of my head for about a month and uh, trying to figure out why. And uh, now I know why, and it's been fixed. Okay. And the good thing is it's not going to kill me. So, um, which means you haven't got rid of me yet. Okay. Now I'll 
switch over to the share screen and bear with me a moment. Okay, I don't know why that's uh, blue. Um, I'm going to run this off the keynote presentation because for some bizarre reason, the uh, normally perfectly reliable iCloud sync hasn't um, synced the uh, updated version of this file to my iMac, which I was working on in my MacBook at home last night and came into the office today and I've tried everything and it won't sync to the, uh, the iMac. So I'm running it off the uh, PDF instead. Okay, so information and risk are key issues for us here. Um, and indeed we'll draw the distinction between risk and uncertainty in a moment. It's um, not just a theoretical concern, it has very significant implications for a range of things like actually buying insurance and whatnot. Um, but, but let's talk more generally about information. Uh, now, obviously, we need information. That's why our group project is so much focused on the market research up front. And a significant proportion of businesses that fail, fail for fairly obvious reasons that should have been uh, knowable to people well in advance if they'd done their homework, okay? Uh, to a remarkable degree, people often don't access basic relevant information um, even when they're going to be investing money. So there's um, a deep relationship between these issues of risk and uncertainty and in information and uh, the relationship really hinges on how much information we've got and how much sense we can make of that information. Now, the, our opening picture, what is this? This is Copenhagen, midwinter in February, snowy, icy. Um, it, was about, uh, it was about minus five degrees uh, when I took that picture. And I was completely frozen, but I love Copenhagen, so I was still walking around. Uh, what's really striking in Copenhagen is in the old city, and Amsterdam is in a similar kind of way, that there are a whole bunch of canals and uh, there are no fences, there are no rails. Um, it's relatively easy to fall into a canal. Now, you don't really want to fall into a canal in February in Copenhagen. Um, I think you would die pretty quickly. Uh, but the, uh, the Danes have this view that, well, everybody knows the risk, the information is out there. Um, we've all grown up with this. Um, there is a canal. You don't fall in it. Uh, you be very careful riding your bicycle, um, especially if you're drunk, uh, been on the yak of it, uh, because, well, it wouldn't be very nice to end up in the canal. But things happen. People do fall in canals. So what are we going to do? They have lots of life rings. So uh, if you see someone in a uh, very cold canal, um, in the in uh, the process of drowning, throw them a life ring, okay? And so this is considered an acceptable risk. The alternative would be to ruin the look of the city by putting up a whole range of walls and fences and whatnot. And um, what, do we, what we see is that often our attitudes to risk are not so stable. We often choose to downplay risk and then once we become alert to a risk or it's become an issue often as a society and as individuals we actually significantly overreact and uh, we could debate all day about the responses to COVID-19 to corona um, whether we've seen this kind of phenomenon insufficient reaction and then maybe belated overreaction um, I would suggest generally in Japan, organizations are often slow to move, but when they do move, they often belatedly make quite extreme reactions because um, on the side of caution, because they're uh, afraid belatedly of getting in trouble, okay? Um, in a funny kind of way, there are parallels between Japan and the UK in terms of reactions. I mean, the uh, Japan moved earlier um, in a voluntarist kind of way, quite effectively. The UK moved too slowly in a highly authoritarian way, um, but in a very selective way, very strict lockdown, um, severe penalties for moving about without a good excuse, unless you're the Prime Minister's friend. 
that's another issue. Um, but they never actually closed their borders, uh, unlike Australia, which closed its borders very quickly. Uh, Japan was quite slow too and very selective, but when it, but belatedly now has severely closed its borders to the point where myself and other international you know, um, non-Japanese citizens viewing here know, everybody knows, that if we leave now, we can't come back. It doesn't matter if you own a house, if you've got education, you've got family here, no, nanjin in sundi mo, detta no mo dore nai. Um, however, um, homeless show has been um, bashed for this. And in fact, Asahi Shimbun wrote a very critical editorial last week on it. And apparently on Friday night, very late, um, the immigration office put up um, on its website a list of circumstances where they will consider allowing people to return in a very I my kind of way. Um, so, but they were still kind of downplaying it because they didn't want to admit that they've made a mistake. So we do see a very strong reactionary element, especially when in the past, maybe arguably people have been um, negligent. People tend to overreact um, in a whole range of ways. So go back to the basics of information. Let me have a, have a quick swig. Um, maybe I should be like NHK, I should cover up brands so that there's no product placement in our videos. Okay. Uh, no, salty nantoka. Okay, I normally just drink water, but I needed the, uh, the salt and sugar shot today. So when we go back to the basic concept of information, actually it's a really hot topic in economics, has been for, for a decade or two now, um, information and imperfect information. Basic economic theory, the simple models of economics assume perfect information and they expect very rapid, very efficient market responses. The reality is, of course, rather different. That actually nobody has complete information about their environment um, and especially the preferences, the resources and the options of their competitors. And, you know, competitors go to great efforts to protect the Kigyo Himitsu, you know, corporate company secrets and their uh, um, criminal sanctions against stealing corporate secrets, for example. So um, this is something that companies take very, uh, very, very seriously. Uh, but in many circumstances, you can be too closed and uh, the optimal level of information sharing is a big issue. And in fact, in my intermediate seminar that finishes afterwards, uh, topic this week is creating options and the theme is very much um, that you have to give in order to receive information wise. And so the optimal level of, of openness so that you can find win-win collaborations without having people steal all your stuff or take advantage of you. Of course, games are based on asymmetric information. You know, poker would not be very interesting if the cards were all printed on trans transparent plastic. You know, someone tried to bluff and you could see exactly what they've got. That, got, that would be extraordinarily um, boring. So actually in so much of human aesthetics, uh, less is more. It's what we can't see that is uh, very often the, uh, the most evocative for us. Um, one architectural critic um, oh, many, many decades ago um, said very interestingly in a very, in a very nuanced way about um, Ise Jingu, that why it was so spiritual is precisely because there's nothing to see and you're not allowed to see it. The inner sanctum is actually empty. And this was also the same in the Jewish temple of old, a couple of thousand years ago, Kodesh Kodeshim, you know, the, the Holy of Holies was this space that only the, the high priests were allowed to go into. And apparently there was nothing in there other than evoking the, you know, the mysterious presence of the gods. Um, so absence is um, often far more evocative for, for people. Um, and this speaks to the ambiguous relationship that people have with uncertainty when we you truly don't know about things. And of course, one of the attractions of, of religious faith is it helps us to make sense of complex world. And there are many things that we don't have information on. And so in a sense, a lot of spirituality and spiritual depictions uh, and spiritual spaces evoke very, very consciously uncertainty. 
you know, it's, it's like romance. Um, um, what you can't see is so much more attractive than what you can see. Just like Morimir, okay? So that's, you know, now notions of kind of class and taste and refinement and um, the, uh, the inescapable, the unattainable obviously has uh, attraction. But in, in terms of basic decision-making as well too, limited information is a significant factor. This games are based on asymmetric information. People have what's referred to by economists as bounded rationality, rational within the limits of their information and computational capabilities. We often say, you know, people are irrational and stupid and whatnot. But if you really believe people are irrational, um, why are they not routinely people being killed at traffic lights? Um, the vast majority of people know to stop on the red light, okay? Um, so we have to assume that people are quite capable of being rational when the, uh, the choice set spills out the downside. When, you, when the risks are pretty obvious of just driving through a red light, um, that actually means that people don't drive through red lights unless they're you know, completely off their head or something like that. At the same time, we are absolutely bombarded with information. So we're using mental shortcuts to um, manage our way through choice complexity. This is, this is why when people criticize brands and branding, they, they are completely unrealistic. Um, walk around a supermarket. The, uh, the power of the brand and of the familiar packaging to just speed up the, the decision making. If you're someone, if you're like me who wants to kind of optimize everything, um, Going shopping with me is quite torturous because I tend to agonize about all the different, you know, price points and packages and value and various brands and attributes and, and um, ev everything is a complex decision. And uh, un unless I'm in a hurry when I just will run through and grab a few of the familiar things. And by the way, it's in terms of uh, lots of research on this in terms of creative processes, it's well understood that successful creative people introduce a lot of um, decision rules into their lives. You know, the, the old joke about um, only, only dressing in black so you don't have to waste time thinking about what goes with what, there's actually quite a lot of truth in that. The really creative, very focused people um, want to save their calculative, contemplative energies for the particular issue they're working on and want to simplify many other aspects of their, of their lives. Yeah, we can only have so much complexity. And that has been well borne out in a lot of research. If you use up all your energies on just managing your personal relationships, for example, you don't leave any energy for art or, or business or your study or anything else, okay? So maybe that person really is bringing you down, okay? You want people who lift you up rather than bring you down. Now, a very important thing is, of course, information makes markets work better, but markets also actually transmit information themselves. They transmit information and they depend on it for effective transmission. Um, what is this picture? This is University of Bologna in, in the city of Bologna, okay? And this is the old way that you found a flatmate, okay? You had a room to rent or you were looking for a room, so you made up a notice and you stuck it up on a post on a notice board and this really cool thing, you'll see them here, um, the old fashioned way, uh, this, when I was a student, this is, <coughs> excuse me, how everything was done. Let me have a drink. How to contact Luca. Um, you just have your name and your number or your email address or whatever, and anyone who's interested can tear it off and they uh, then have your, have your name. Okay, and that's been something that's been done for decades. Now, of course, there are a bunch of apps that, are, that have uh, arisen now. Uh, there are a couple of people, you know, study abroad if you get to go to Europe um, or Australia or whatnot. Hopefully things will be much better in a year. Then uh, you'll find that there are a bunch of apps where you can actually meet people who are looking for um, roommates. So a lot of this creating of platforms to connect people is significant, uh, getting away from old analog styles. But sometimes the analog is still the most efficient. In, in a situation where everyone is in the same university, in the same place, and there's a high level of trust, um, clearly in that case, Luke is not worried about having the, the phone number out there if the target is just fellow students. Um, that's kind of 
should be that there are no psychos, you know, in your own university. But anyway, so information is concept. Okay. Uh, key thing, uh, the recognition of imperfect information in markets, very strong emphasis in transaction cost economics. And we'll talk further about this in terms of the boundaries of the firm. Informa it emphasizes that information is costly, monitoring the behavior of your agents and partners. And imperfect information creates lots of opportunities for bad behavior um, and arbitrage we've uh, already talked about, but ripping people off, taking advantage. And I've already spoken to these um, issues in uh, one of the presentations online. Okay, so in terms of information as concept, we also see the role of information to firms and how this becomes a major resource for companies. Now, um, information plus understanding is knowledge. Knowledge is something that you can act on, okay? It's a major source of a firm's continuing um, competitive advantage. And I had a formative experience in my first day of university as an undergraduate student at the University of Queensland, and I went on a library tour. I'm surprised I got organized enough to go and voluntarily go on a library tour, but I did. I remember this tough old librarian, she showed us the, cop the photocopiers uh, corner, and she said, here's where you get your photocopy card, and um, lots of your articles you will need to read. We used to have to read a lot. Um, they're all, there was a copy of them in the corner organized by course that you couldn't take out and then you copied them yourselves. None of this just downloading for a website or something. Um, but I remember she, uh, she said to us, listen up. And I was chatting with my friend. She said, yeah, you, you in particular, you in particular, you, you look like the chatty type, listen up. You need to know this. And I kind of paid attention. And she said, copying is not learning. Repeat after me. And I said, oh, copying is not learning. And she said, you should get that tattooed on you. And that um, very much has stuck with me because I remember plenty of time, plenty of times I would go to the university. I had a big report due. I'd go to the library. I'd copy some stuff out of books. I'd copy some journal articles. I'd put it in my bag and say, oh, I'm working hard. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well here. And then I go to the pub with my mates. Um, and if I was lucky, I didn't lose my copies. Um, I just left them in my car and of course I only had one drink because I had to drive. Um, but spoke a lot of bullshit with my friends. Uh, and the old librarian had a really fundamental point that we have a wealth of information. It's actually turning that information into understanding is the critical process. Organizations have enormous amounts of data. Um, point of sale data. Remarkably few companies make full sense of that data. But if you effectively manage your information, it can be incredibly empowering. Um, no organization does this particularly well. Um, Wasada could do so much more. Um, I've been arguing for years we should have, have an information project. Um, I, I suspect that there are very clear patterns on um, what people study in Waseda, what they study abroad, where they study it, and how they end up doing in their program, that there may be predictive elements there. But um, the way our data systems have been, they haven't talked to each other in the past. That's why these systems integration challenges are really important. Um, that you know, we had different data on study abroad, that's CIE, you know, we've got the SILS data, um, admissions is something completely separate. I really suspect if we could connect those up, we could find some really interesting patterns. And so this is uh, where there is so much happening in terms of, of consultancy, of coming into organizations and say, you, you have so much information about your clients, or your students, or your patients, or whatever, but um, you don't have knowledge. You haven't really turned it into understanding that you can act on. And if you can actually get your systems talking to each other, you can interrogate that data and it will help your clients, maybe give you a competitive advantage. Now let's talk very briefly about risk, okay? Simple distinction, risk is known probabilities. You can put a number on this. Um, insurance companies, medical researchers, governments, if they ask themselves the question, have a very good sense of the risk that you will 
get cancer. Okay. Uh, they know 18 to 22 demographic um, frequency of rates of cancer, very good probabilities. When you, when you have that statistics, don't can say, oh, suji teki ni dekiru. So they dekiru to hokken mo chanto tarashi kaku de ureru toka. So you can price insurance. Um, effectively, you can sell that risk to other people and they're going to want a premium to take that risk off you um, precisely because you have detailed numbers. Um, when we get into uncertainty, we don't have precise probabilities. Okay. By the way, that's not a horrible terrorist attack. Um, it does look like a horrible blood splatter after a bombing. Um, it was actually art at Narita. That is hewa boke. Um, in airports in countries that have had terrorist attacks, they would never do an art project like that because that just looks so gross, okay? Um, in a bunch of countries, that would be traumatic. In Japan, it's just like, oh, art the jar. Um, so uh, if you read the fine print of a travel insurance policy, you will discover that uh, a whole bunch of things are not covered by insurance. And here's a tip. If you have, do have travel insurance, when we get back to being tr to, to traveling, um, if you're going to get murdered, if you're going to be stabbed to death, get, make sure you are stabbed to death by your angry ex. Um, you know, it's much better to be stabbed to death by your ex who comes and says, you cheating bastard, <clears throat> knifes you to death. Because um, if you're just murdered, uh, murdered is generally treated as a uh, known probability. It's treated as a risk factor. And the probability of you being murdered is for regularly murdered is normally covered by insurance and you get killed and your family will get lots of money. Okay. Maybe like a million dollars or something. Okay. Um, if on the other hand, you are murdered for political reasons, normally that's part of the exclusions. So if someone says, you know, runs at you and says, you fascist pig die, blah, you know, I'm with the revolutionary front for the liberation of whatever <laughs> stabs you to death. Um, the insurance company can refuse to pay anything because it was a political act. And this has been an issue for terrorism and a whole range of things. And unfortunately, lots of travel insurance doesn't cover pandemics either. So here's a really fundamental point. One of the major factors which will make it very difficult for people to start traveling again, even when governments allow people to freely cross borders, when airlines start flying, is uh, you won't be able to get travel insurance for anything related to COVID-19. So you will have to take that risk on yourself. And why? Uh, the insurance companies assert that the statistics of pandemics are insufficiently robust that it, that it figures as uncertainty. Now, one could very much argue against that given the amount of effort being invested in understanding COVID-19, um, but that's gonna be a, a set of legal issues. Now, all organizations are involved in risk management. Uh, this is a critical thing that companies do now, along with their financial reporting. So risk assessment, risk management, key roles. And uh, I've had to do this for years in universities when I was in Australia. Every time I, I took students out, uh, I had outside the university campus, I had to fill out a risk assessment, um, tick boxes to say that there are no... Um, known unusual risks, for example, you know, even, even down to things like heat stroke, blah, blah, blah. Did I tell everyone to wear a hat? Yes. Tick, 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 tick. Okay. All really for insurance uh, purposes. Now, risk management is a holistic approach. And the critical thing is it's not about no risk, that it's about reducing risk to an acceptable level, a bearable level. And this is going to be the critical thing with COVID-19 responses. Just how much risk will we be prepared to bear as societies when we remove border controls, for example? Very often we get unstable responses to uncertainty. People tend to underestimate the probability of rare catastrophic events, black swan events. COVID-19 is a classic one. Um, we tend to overestimate the probability once an example of it happens. 
And I've been told about a, a Chinese proverb that says, um, a man who's being bitten by a snake will fear rope for 10 years. I can tell you growing up in Australia, you don't actually have to have been bitten by the snake. You only have to have heard snake bite stories um, to when you go out at night to put the rubbish out and you step on the garden hose and you jump a meter in the air because you think you've just stepped on a bloody taipan snake, which might kill you or something. Um, you tend to fear, uh, you tend to see what you fear. Okay. That's why people who've been once broken hearted may never love again because they're so afraid of having their hearts broken again. So, mm. sob, sob. okay. Um, anyway, the critical thing is we know that people are very poor at estimating the odds of certain negative events. Um, and politics does get in the way and there are various notions about this saliency effect and whatnot. Someone did a very good analysis, which pointed out during the Bush administration after 9-11, that you had um, Americans had a much greater chance of slipping over in the bathtub, hitting their head and dying than they did of being the victim in a terrorist attack. But you did not have the president of the United States go on t television and say, Tonight, my fellow Americans, I declare a war on slippery bathtubs. He did declare a war on terror because of this salient heuristic. Um, the image of 9-11 was so confronting to people that they feared being a victim of a terrorist attack, even though many of the far greater risks to their lives, their well-being, um, were in very mundane events that they actually didn't pay any attention to whatsoever. Okay. Um, just in terms of game theory, I'm not going to talk about game theory other than to simply note this. This is a whole subfield which comes out of microeconomics and is, which is used in a range of fields, including international relations, um, business negotiations, so many things. It's quite sophisticated mathematics of, of modeling choice sets. Um, critical things is that parties' choices impact on each other. And we have things like prisoner's dilemma and whatnot. We have several courses on game theory that you can take here if you're interested. Most games are what we call non-cooperative and characterized by information asymmetry. They can be applied to a whole range of fields. And um, there is one concept from economics I just want to mention because often people in economics and business use this language. And this is this notion of signaling effects that um, things you pre are prepared to do send signals to other parties. It's very difficult to know exactly what someone's intentions are or what you really believe. So a really big one in business, a really basic one, is if someone is asking you to invest in their business, ask them how invested in it they are, okay? How much, and I've mentioned this earlier in the course, skin in the game do they have? So how much are you investing in this, okay? How much do you have to lose if this doesn't work out? That is a very powerful signal. If they're investing their life savings in it, at least you know they're sincere, okay? There must be a symmetry of risk for you to be involved in something. If not, the signaling effects are really awful. You can't take someone seriously. Now in mature stable industries, um, there's often very little uncertainty. It's more like playing a sport with very defined rooms, uh, rules, whether it's pool, snooker, rugby, or whatever, people know the rules of the game. There's a winner, there's a loser, um, but the industry is very stable. And so it's really about mastering, mastering the existing industry. But when there's rapid technological change or the, you know, that creative destruction, that disruption that comes with um, entrepreneurship, we shift from a world of uh, effectively stability with known risk factors to uncertainty. Now, just very briefly, I'm conscious of our, of our time here. Um, I just want to em emphasize the, uh, this notion of information goods. And uh, so much of specialist services have an information dimension. Go to the doctor, you go to an architect, a structural engineer, effectively they're selling their knowledge. Um, Kenneth Arrow, Nobel Prize for, amongst other things, recognizing the paradox of knowledge. It's very difficult to know how much information is, is enough, um, how much to spend on getting more um, information. What we tend to do is we tend to only get a second opinion if we don't like the first opinion, okay? You go to a doctor, 
And the doctor says, no, no, you don't need to worry. Those recurrent headaches you got, not a problem. You'll be okay. Have drink more water, have a sleep. Okay. You go to the doctor and the doctor says, I think you might have a brain tumor. You want to get a second opinion. Okay. Um, but actually you should be rather more worried about the first opinion than the second opinion. Um, and you should, it makes more sense to get the second opinion when you're told you're okay. And I lost a friend to a brain tumor and another one who's still alive, but has been battling for 20 years, both of whom were told by the first and the second doctor they went to, um, that they were fine, that they just needed to drink more and rest more, uh, more water, not alcohol. Okay. Um, so we're actually not very rational in terms of our purchases of information. On the other hand, we can also very much fear what's around the next corner. This is the hesitancy to commit. Yeah, he's all right, but I'm, you know, I might meet, might meet Mr. Right around the corner, okay? Till eventually you get the point where you suddenly realize uh, there ain't no Mr. Right and you suddenly rush, you know, you're, you're married to the next person you meet in the bus, okay? Um, so there is a, there's a lot of irrationality in our choice set, okay? Um, a final thing on this, because we're, we're right at time, I'll leave it here and I'll pick up um, or I'll, uh, next week or I'll, I'll do a, a VOD, I'm not quite sure. Um, the other basic problem is when it comes to actually selling information, it's very difficult to sell it because people don't know its value in advance. So once they actually know its value, they're less likely to pay for it. Um, if the only way you can show its value is by showing it to them in the first place. Okay. And so reputation becomes hugely important in the markets for information goods. And so there's a whole range of ways for this um, sample chapters. If you look at Kindle, for example, um, reviews are critical. Reputation becomes critical and particularly rating agencies in financial markets are fundamental to financial risk management. We'll leave it there. I will bring a, uh, a post. Um, I, I'll do a video on demand very specifically about information goods, which relates back to that poll exercise we did. Okay. I'm um, sorry for the bit slow kickoff uh, this week. Uh, would have helped if I'd made sure you had the uh, Zoom login details earlier than 10 minutes before we started. I'll be more attentive to it. Um, finally, I've given everyone a schedule for our um, assessment items we're going to have, and I, and I haven't spoken to them. My apologies. Um, but there, you'll have a quiz, which I will release after this class time next week. Okay. Um, but, uh, on the weeks that are shown, they are, when, there's, when it's video on demand, I'll still do a live session, but it's actually a consultation session. So you can talk to me about any of the issues in the course and whatnot. Um, the quizzes are released um, after the consultation session for the very simple reason that otherwise it's just not going to work because people are just going to ask me the answers to the quiz. Okay, So um, bring your questions uh, and interact with me and uh, then the quiz will, will be released. And I'm also happy to use that consultation session for other broad discussions of study abroad and things like that. Um, some of you were in the, uh, the class last night. Okay, so have a look at that one page overview. Um, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. I will be giving you an update on the two small tasks that you will be assigned. Um, they're quite straightforward, in addition to, of course, the, uh, the project that you have to do. So I'll let you go. Thank you very much and uh, keep happy and healthy. And uh, if you can get out, enjoy this nice hot summer-like summer afternoon. Thank you.